My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I come to you today with a heavy heart and a burning message from the Lord. As we gather here in His presence, let us turn our attention to a passage of Scripture that speaks directly to our lives and our responsibilities as followers of Jesus Christ. In Numbers 32, verse 23, we find these sobering words, Be sure your sin will find you out. These words were spoken by Moses to the tribes of Reuben and Gad, and they ring just as true for us today as they did for the Israelites thousands of years ago. As I stand before you, I am reminded of the words of the great preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who delivered a powerful sermon on this very text on August 5, 1886, at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. The truths he shared then are just as relevant to us now, perhaps even more so in our modern age of comfort and convenience. Let us consider the context of this passage. The Israelites had just conquered the lands of Og, king of Bashan, and Sihon, king of the Amorites. The tribes of Reuben and Gad, seeing the rich pastures of this newly conquered land, approached Moses with a request. They asked to settle in this land east of the Jordan, rather than crossing over with their brethren to fight for the Promised Land. On the surface, this might seem like a reasonable request. After all, the land was suitable for their flocks, and it had already been conquered. Why not settle there and avoid further conflict? But Moses, in his God-given wisdom, saw the danger in this request. He asked them a penetrating question. Shall your brothers go to W.R. while you sit here? My friends, this question echoes through the centuries and strikes at the heart of our own complacency and self-interest. How often do we, as Christians, seek our own comfort while our brothers and sisters in Christ struggle? How often do we rest content in our blessings while the lost perish around us? As we delve deeper into this passage and Spurgeon's insights, we must first understand the nature of the sin being addressed. This is not a sermon about the obvious sins that we so often condemn, murder, theft, or lying. No, this message strikes at something far more subtle and perhaps even more dangerous, the sin of doing nothing. It is a sin of omission, a failure to act when action is required, a neglect of our duty as followers of Christ. This sin is particularly insidious because it is the sin of God's own people, it is not the sin of the Egyptians or the Philistines, but the sin of those who claim to belong to the Lord. My dear friends, this message is for us, for you and for me. It is for all who profess the name of Christ, all who claim to be part of His church. We must examine our hearts and ask ourselves, are we guilty of this great sin of doing nothing? Consider the tribes of Reuben and Gad, they were not proposing to do anything explicitly wrong. They simply wanted to settle in a land that seemed good to them. But in doing so, they were shirking their responsibility to their brethren and to God. They were saying, in effect, we have our portion. Let the others fight for theirs. Is this not the attitude we sometimes adopt in our own spiritual lives? How many of us are content to enjoy the blessings of salvation? to bask in the comfort of God's love while doing little or nothing to advance His kingdom? We attend church, we read our Bibles, we pray for our own needs, but do we actively engage in the spiritual warfare that rages around us? Do we reach out to the lost, support our fellow believers, or sacrifice our comfort for the sake of the gospel? Spurgeon pointedly remarks, Reuben would rather abide by the sheepfolds. Gad has more delight in the bleeding of the sheep and in the folding of the lambs in his bosom than in throwing himself into the forefront of the battle. How convicting these words are. How often do we prefer the comfort of our spiritual sheepfolds to the challenges of the spiritual battlefield? This leads us to recognize that the sin of doing nothing is, at its core, a sin of idleness and self-indulgence. It is the sin of those who say, we are safe, we have passed from death to life, 
We are washed in Christ's precious blood, and therefore we are secure. While these statements are true, they become dangerous when they lead us to complacency and inaction. My brothers and sisters, our salvation is not meant to be the end of our spiritual journey, but the beginning. It is not a license for spiritual laziness, but a call to action. As the Apostle Paul reminds us, we are saved by grace through faith, and this is not our own doing. It is the gift of God. But he goes on to say that we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Yet how often do we see this sin of idleness manifested in our churches? On Sundays, many come to be well-fed spiritually, looking for sermons that will nourish their souls. But the thought does not occur to them that there is something else to be done besides feeding. Soul-saving is pushed into the background. The crowds are perishing at their gates. The multitudes with their sins defile the air. The age is getting worse and worse. And yet these people want pleasant things preached to them. They crowd to spiritual feasts, delighting in sermons, conferences, and Bible readings. But regular service in ordinary ways is neglected. Not a hand's turn will they do. They put on no armor. They grasp no sword. They wield no sling. They throw no stone. Having received their portion, they sit down in carnal security, satisfied to do nothing. They neither work for life nor from life. They are errant sluggards, as lazy as they are lawless. But let us be clear, my friends. The sin of doing nothing is not a small matter. It is, as Spurgeon says, about the biggest of all sins, for it involves most of the others. It breaks both tables of the law and has in it a huge idolatry of self, which neither allows love to God nor man. It is a horrible idleness from which we must pray for God to save us. Moreover, this sin of doing nothing is also a sin of selfishness. The tribes of Gad and Reuben were essentially saying, what about us? We must look to ourselves. Is this not the attitude we sometimes adopt? Every man for himself and God for us all, as the proverb goes. But this is not the way of Christ. This is not the heart of the gospel. I am reminded of the story of Cain, who, when questioned about his brother Abel, responded, Am I my brother's keeper? The answer, my friends, is a resounding yes. We are indeed our brother's keeper. Every man is either the keeper of his brother or the destroyer of his brother. Murder can be wrought without an act or even a will. It can be and is constantly accomplished by neglect. Consider the millions in our cities who are unevangelized. Who is guilty of their spiritual starvation? Are not idle Christians starving the multitude by refusing to hand out the bread of life? Is this not a grievous sin? Some might argue they can conquer the land themselves. God is with them and he can do his own work. Therefore, I do not see that I need trouble myself about other people. But this is selfishness and selfishness is never worse than when it puts on the garb of religion. Think of a boy at school who selfishly feeds himself upon his luxuries and gives nothing to his young companions. He is generally their ridicule, the greedy boy whom all despise. Or consider a man with large stores who, in time of famine, would feed himself but never think of the poor. He is despised among men. But what shall we say of the man who, concerning the things of the soul, concerning heaven and hell and Christ and eternity, is so selfish that being saved himself, he cares not one jot for others. Such a person is so unbrotherly that I am half afraid he is no brother at all. He is so inhuman that I can scarcely think a touch of the life of Christ has ever quickened him. How can he be a Christian who is not like Christ? How can he claim to follow the one who gave his life for others, yet feel, well, I'm all right. And if I look to myself, other people must look to themselves. God will see to them all, no doubt. I have nothing to do with it. My dear friends, 
Unless we shake off this horrible selfishness and realize that the very essence of our religion lies in love and that one of the first fruits of it is to make us care about the salvation of our fellow men, we are in grave danger. The words of our text threaten us very solemnly. If you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. But there is more to this sin of doing nothing. It is also a sin of ingratitude. Consider how we came to be Christians. Was it not through the faithful witness of those who came before us? We owe much to past ages and much to present laborers. There is no man among us who does not stand immensely indebted to the Church of God. Though God is our Father, the Church is our Mother, and through her various agencies, we have been born to God. Do we acknowledge all this debt? Are we going to pay it? Or are we to receive all and then give out nothing at all? Are we to be like candles burning under bushels? Are we to waste our lives by much receiving and little distributing? This will never do. This is not life, but death. I do not charge this home upon anybody personally, but if this cap fits anybody, I pray let them wear it. If any man must acknowledge his obligation to the Church of God and yet is not repaying it, let him cover his face for very shame. Will you not hand on the light you have received? Verily you deserve to perish in darkness if you will not. Are you fed? And will you not break your bread to the hungry or pass a cup of cold water to the thirsty? What are you, strange and great, that you should simply be a stagnant reservoir into which streams of mercy shall flow, never to run out of you again, but to stand and putrefy in selfishness? Remember the Dead Sea and tremble lest you be like it, accursed and cursing all around you. O oh God, have mercy upon the great mass of professing people to whom this must be solemnly applied, that they receive but give to you and to your cause so little, either of time, substance, talent, prayer, or anything else. Now let us consider what the chief consequence of this sin is. Moses tells us plainly, Behold, you have sinned against the Lord. This is the peculiar atrocity of their sin, that it would be leveled at God himself. We might be tempted to think that by not helping their brethren, they would be sinning against their fellow Israelites. But Moses looks beyond this to the greater offense, the sin against God. In this, Moses anticipated the confession of David, who, after committing adultery and murder, cried out to God, Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. To refuse to help their brethren would be disobedience to the Lord. Did he not command all Israel to drive out the Canaanites? In like manner, my friends, neglect of holy work is a positive sin against the Lord. It is disobedience against the Lord not to be preaching his truth if we are able to do so. Did not our Lord say, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? This command was not confined to a dozen or so, but was meant for all his people, as they have opportunity and ability. We who hear the gospel are bidden to proclaim it, for it is written, Let him who hears say, Come. The hearer of the gospel is bound to be a repeater of the gospel. We are all called upon, as we know the Lord, to tell others what the Lord has told to us. If we do not do so, we are guilty of disobedience to a great gospel precept. Moreover, we are certainly guilty of ingratitude. If, as I have already said, we owe so much to other men, and yet do not seek to bless mankind, we are ungrateful. But chiefly, we owe everything to the grace of God. If God has given us grace in our own hearts and saved us with the precious blood of the only begotten, how can we sit still and allow others to perish? As we value our own salvation, we are under bonds to make it known. We rejoice to be in the kingdom of God. Should we not spend and be spent for the growth of that kingdom? He who does not bear arms in this war is a traitor to his sovereign Lord. There would be sin against God in the conduct of these people if they did not aid in the conquest of Canaan, for they would be dividing God's Israel. 
Shall the Lord's heritage be rent in twain? God meant them all to keep together. They all came out of Egypt together. They all marched through the wilderness together, and now he meant them to fight his battles together. Were these to take their inheritance and abide among the sheep coats and leave the other ten and a half tribes to go over Jordan and wage the war alone? This would be scattering the family of God. If it be that any of us are dividing the church of God, that is, dividing it into drones and workers, this would be a terrible division. I fear that it exists already. It is apparent to those who are able to observe, and it is mourned over by those who are jealous for the God of Israel. Half the schisms in churches arise out of the real division which exists between idlers and workers. Mind this, be not causers of division by being busy bodies, working not at all. If you are not serving the Lord, you are sinning against the sacred trinity. You sin against our Father, who would have you do good and be imitators of Him as dear children. You sin against the Son of God, who has bought you with a price that you might be zealous for His glory. You sin against the Holy Ghost, whose impulses are not to sleep and idleness, but to quickening and holiness. Now, we come to the most serious point. What will come of this sin of doing nothing? What will be its consequences? The answer is clear and sobering. Be sure your sin will find you out. These Gadites and Reubenites would be sure to be found out by their own neglect. Their sin would find them out to their shame and sorrow if they did not lend all their strength to their brethren according to their promise. It would find them out thus. They would be ill at ease. One of these days, their sin would leap upon their consciences as a lion on its prey. They would wake up and say, We were wrong. We were bound to have taken our share in that war. Every man among them that was good for anything would be troubled in heart because he had failed to do his duty in the hour of need. He would feel uneasy. He would not want anybody to point him out with the finger, but he would point himself out. He would say to himself, I failed in that case. I know I did. I acted very wrongly. I ought to have been with Joshua, chasing out those Canaanites. I received my own portion of the land, and I ought, therefore, to have helped others to win their portions. When conscience was thus aroused, they would also feel themselves to be mean and despicable. As king after king was conquered, and the notes of victory were heard all over Canaan, they would think themselves mice, rather than men, to have shunned so glorious a conflict. They would feel disgraced by their own inaction. Their manhood would be held cheap by the other tribes. In fact, they would become a byword and a proverb, as men do who are notoriously greedy and selfish. Surely it is an intolerable disgrace to anyone to profess to be a man of God and to have no care about the souls of others while they are perishing by millions. More than that, the tribes who went not to the war would be enfeebled by their own inaction. God would have his people learn war, but if these men did not go to the fight, they would not be soldiers, and they would not be able to take care of themselves when their land was invaded. How much of sacred education we miss when we turn away from the service of God! I believe that no man understands salvation so well as the man who, having tasted it for himself, has also preached it to those about him. If you want to know the evil of the human heart, try to do good to the unconverted and endeavor to guide the unbeliever to Jesus. Get a dozen girls around you, my sister, and watch the workings of their hearts as you seek to lead them to Christ, and you will learn much more than you knew before. My dear brother, gather a number of youths about you and observe their feelings and conduct while you seek their conversion. You will soon know the depravity of human nature if you watch for souls for a little season. And if you get souls converted and act as a spiritual father to them, you will soon see how much they need the Holy Spirit to keep them and how much you need Him to keep you also, for your patience will be tried. You will learn both the sweet and the bitter of the things of God by being engaged in Christ's service. Jesus says, 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Service is a yoke we must bear in order to learn of Christ. The only way to learn to swim is to get into the water. To be a soldier and never know the smell of gunpowder is impossible. At least, such soldiers are little to be relied on in case of war. No, no, our sin, if we do nothing, will find us out in our being enfeebled, in our being disgraced, in our feeling that we are mean, and in the accusation of our conscience. Let us find this sin out and shake ourselves free from it before it finds us out. Their sin would also have found them out had they fallen into it because they would have been divided from the rest of God's Israel. If they had not gone across the Jordan to fight, the ten and a half tribes would always have said, What have we to do with you? The Jordan rolls between us, and so let it do. We do not want any connection with those who acted so basely to us in our hour of need. They would practically have cut themselves off from union with the Israel of God, and they would have secured to themselves the loss of all fellowship with earnest men. Those who are non-workers lose much by not keeping pace with those who are running the heavenly race. The active are happy. The hand of the diligent makes rich in a spiritual sense. There is that withholds more than is meat, and it tends to poverty. I am sure it is so in a spiritual sense. To come more practically home, brethren beloved, if you and I are not serving the Lord, our sin will find us out. It will find us out perhaps in this way. There will be many added to the church, and God will prosper it, and we shall hear of it, but we shall feel no joy therein. We had no finger in the work, and we shall find no comfort in the result. We did not point out the way to troubled consciences. We never went to early morning prayer meetings, nor to any prayer meetings, to pray for a blessing. We never spoke a word or even gave a tract away, and therefore we shall see the blessing with our eyes, but we shall not eat thereof. While God's people lift up their loud hallelujahs of joy, we shall only mourn, my leanness, my leanness, woe unto me. It is no joy to see a harvest reaped from fields which we refuse to plow. It may be that you will begin to lose all the sweetness of public services by doing nothing. You lose your appetite. Many a person who has no appetite needs a wise doctor to say to him, Of course you cannot eat, for you do not work. Exercise yourself, and your appetite will return. He that earns his breakfast enjoys his breakfast, and he who labors for Christ finds that the services of the sanctuary are exceedingly sweet to him. I know some dear brethren here who cannot get to a Sunday sermon because they have something to do for their Lord throughout the Sabbath. Therefore, they drop into this Thursday evening sermon. Thus they gain a Sabbath in the middle of the week, which is exceedingly sweet to them, they can only attend one service on the Sunday, but that is doubly refreshing to them. They are engaged at the ragged school or at the corner of the street where they are accustomed to preach, and the Lord makes up to them their lost opportunities. Believe me, when they do get a meal, they heartily appreciate it, for they come with an appetite which they have gathered in the service of their master. If you do not work, your sin will find you out in the loss of enjoyment when present at the means of grace. I've known this sin find people out in their families. There is a Christian man. We honor and love him, but he has a son that is a drunkard. Did his good father ever bear any protest against strong drink in all his life? Though he did not like the blue ribbon, of course. I will not dispute about total abstinence, but I do not feel much astonished at a boy drinking much when he sees his godly father drink a little regularly. Every man should labor by precept and example to put down intemperance, and he who does not do so may be sure that his sin will find him out. Here is another. His children have all grown up thoughtless, careless, giddy. He took them to his place of worship, and he now inquires, why are they not converted? Did he ever take them one by one and pray with them? Did he ever speak earnestly to each boy and each girl and labor for the conversion of each one? 
I'm afraid that in many cases nothing of the sort has been attempted. Certain mistaken individuals almost think it wrong to seek the conversion of their children while they are children, and their sin finds them out when they see them growing up in ungodliness. Besides, if we do not look after God's children, it may be that He will not look after ours. No, says God, there were other people's children in the streets, and you had no concern about them. Why should your children fare better? You never opened a ragged school for the poor. Why should I bless you? There were men in your employment by whom you gained your living, but you never spoke to them about their souls, nor cared whether they were saved or damned. And I am not going to look after your family when you have no concern for mine. Be sure your sin will find you out. I do not know how this warning may come home to any brother or sister here who has been idling, but it is better that my warning should find him out than that his sin should find him out. I do not know whether there are any idlers here, though I have pretty shrewd guesses that there are. Friends, neglect of the Lord's work will come home to you, and I will tell you when it will come to you if it does not do so before. When you are sick and ill, your faith in Christ will bring you great comfort, but you will be sorrowful if you have to say to yourself, Oh, that I had served God while I was young. A friend said to me not long ago, My dear sir, you're often laid aside, and no doubt the reason is the imprudent manner in which you worked away in your youth. You preached ten times in a week almost all the year round, year after year, and of course you wore yourself out. Oh, yes, I said, it may be so, but I do not regret it in the least. Thank God I preached with all my might all over the land when I could do so, and I would again if I could only get renewed strength. If I cannot work so much as in earlier days, I have not the misery of saying, I wasted my opportunities and spent my best days in ease. I do say to myself, would God I had done more or had done it better, but I am thankful to be able to exonerate myself from all charge of sloth. If those of us who do much have to whip ourselves a bit, what should those do who practically do nothing at all and discourage others? What can idlers do but fear that their sin will find them out? Thus far, I have spoken to God's people, and if you think that this is rather rough upon them, what shall I say to you who do not love the Lord at all? Oh, if the fan that is in Christ's hand purges his own floor in this stern way, what will that fan do with you who are as chaff to the wheat? If he sits here as a refiner and purifies the sons of Levi and puts even the gold into the fire, what will become of the dross? If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? If the language of God is sharp even to his own beloved, because he says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. What will his language be to those who are not his children, but are living in open rebellion against him? Tremble you that forget God. Here are his own words. Now consider this. You that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. God help you to flee from the sin of doing nothing. The Lord Jesus Christ himself lead you into the Father's service. May he grant you repentance unto life, faith in his dear Son, and then the sacred zeal which shall lead you to spend and be spent in the Master's service. And now, as we draw this message to a close, let us reflect on the profound implications of the sin of doing nothing. It is a sin that creeps in silently, often disguised as contentment or even spiritual maturity. But make no mistake, dear friends, it is a deadly poison to our souls and a hindrance to the advancement of God's kingdom. Consider the parable of the talents that our Lord Jesus taught. The Master commended and rewarded the servants who had put their talents to use. But to the one who had hidden his talent, he said, You wicked and lazy servant! These are words that none of us would ever want to hear from our Savior's lips. But take heart, for there is hope. Our God is merciful and gracious, 
always ready to forgive and restore those who turn to Him in repentance. If the Holy Spirit is convicting you of the sin of doing nothing, do not harden your heart. Instead, confess your sin to the Lord, receive His forgiveness, and ask Him to ignite in you a passion for His service. Let us covenant together to give Him our all, our time, our talents, our treasures, our very lives. For in the end, we will discover that it is in losing our lives for His sake that we truly find them. The needs are great, the time is short, but our God is mighty. Let us go forth from this place with renewed zeal, determined to be active participants in the great work of God's kingdom. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all as you go forth to serve Him. And may we one day stand together before His throne, having fought the good fight, finished the race, and kept the faith, to hear those blessed words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Master. Amen.